Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Alexandra and this is A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. So today I have a few ideas that I want to talk about. I have not prepared a script or an outline, so we are going to have to heavily rely on editing for this. So I have this idea and I'm just going to call it an idea. Normally I would come in here and say, we're starting a new series. Um, but let's be honest with ourselves here for a little bit. I'm very bad at keeping up with series. So it's a wonder that the podcast episodes even go up, to be honest. I have a really hard time unless I am responsible to some sort of people outside of myself, just doing it for myself. Part of the reason why I'm not so great at this YouTube game, but that's okay. I had an idea that I think could be fun and we'll see if we'll do it. This is a uh, casual criticism. If you follow me over on TikTok, which you totally should, I tend to be a little bit more consistent over there. You will know that I am working on reading all of the novels by Agatha Christie. Actually, it may have come up in our Agatha Christie episode as well, which I will link down below. And I am now getting to the end of Miss Marple. I'm in the second to last Miss Marple novel called Bertram's Hotel. The last one is Nemesis. I happen to have already read it because it was just one of the ones that I picked up at the bookstore. And I have been reflecting on Agatha Christie since our episode. I've also been reflecting on how this, the sort of classic mystery novel works, <sighs> Miss Marple as a character. And I decided to um, sit down and, and do a classic Alexandra analytical video. So one thing that I always like to do is sort of encourage the like how to side as well as share my thoughts on what I think are some of the deeper meanings or deeper ideas that are inside of the works of literature that we read. So a little insight into my process. I like to sit down and write out my own ideas first and then I like to go do a little bit of research. If like me you don't have access to a university library it is actually free to have a subscription to JSTOR with just a regular email, a non-university email, and they allow you to read 100 articles online every month. Unfortunately, JSTOR tends to have out-of-date articles, so they tend not to have the most recent research. But for me, for casual criticism, that is sufficient, I think, for our purposes. So let me go ahead and actually pull up the article. So this is the article that I found, which was actually really interesting. It's called Spinster Surveillance and Speech, The Case of Miss Marple, Miss Mole, and Miss Jekyll. This is by Kathy Metzi from Simon Fraser University. It was published in 2010 in the Journal of Modern Literature. I'll have it linked down below. Uh, so I really enjoyed this article. It's comparing works from multiple authors from the Golden Age, not just Agatha Christie, but it is talking about Miss Marple. So let me go ahead and start with my ideas that I was thinking about, talk a little bit about this novel or this article, and then some of the new ideas that I generated based on thinking about what this uh, critic had to say. So to start with, I was I have been particularly interested in this idea of what is a cozy mystery? What makes a mystery cozy? Why do we have that concept? We have an understanding that there's something ironic about it because we're talking about a murder mystery story and yet we find them to be comforting. I find myself turning to Agatha Christie for a comfort read. And I think that it has a couple advantages going for it. One is that it has a very clear-sighted and bold-faced look at the evil that we have to encounter in our everyday lives. I think a story that tries to sort of ignore the reality of evil or explain it away or make all of their evil characters purely evil and all of their good characters purely good is insufficient in its exploration of human nature and it's something that we would either find saccharine or immature or just not really believable. But a murder mystery novel or any mystery novel that's dealing with various crimes, because it's encountering the wicked things that humans do. It's not trying to hide it. And then I think the where the coziness comes in, so that's where it is believable. And it seems like it can actually maybe tell us something about ourselves. And where the coziness comes in is not in its lack of evil, but in its tidiness, in its 
uh, clarity, in its coherence, in its lack of chaos and lack of confusion. The mystery is all tied up at the end, so we get to resolve into a world that is organized again. It's no longer topsy-turvy. The questions that plague us at the opening of the story are all resolved. And so the comfort comes in its clarity and coherence. And Miss Marple, in particular, is a character who embodies that reality, because of course she's our main character heroine, she is our main character detective. She has this clarity and insight that we wish we could all have into our lives. And not only does she resolve questions around the murder, which is sort of the main point, she's able to solve the mystery, but she also often is giving characters all different types of advice about their relationships or about their careers or about their own nature or what sort of decisions they should make. She's almost oracular. You know, we, we, she's imbued with the sense of like, she has observed so much of human nature and she's so intelligent and she has this insights into all of us that she can tell us for our, ourselves, like what we should do with our lives. And that sort of oracular delivered truth is just so comforting because there's no reason for us to think that she's giving Bad advice or that she would be wrong. But we have this sense, full faith, that she's 100% right in the declarations that she makes and the sorts of um, advice that she gives. And it's extremely comforting. Now, the essay that I had read, the one that I referenced earlier, is dealing with this role of the spinster and their ability to have even the opportunity to surveil everyone, to observe them. And this is something that I found really interesting. It references the essay by Freud called the Unheimlich, or the Uncanny. It's also available online. I'll see if I can also link that down below. It's one of my favorite essays to have literature students read. It's probably entirely useless for, from in the scope of psychology. But in terms of storytelling, in terms of what kinds of stories we tell ourselves, and particularly around the question of what we consider private versus what we consider public, this is really what the uncanny is all about. So fundamentally, if you kind of look at the spaces that we create, the interior spaces, say of homes or of cozy little villages, this will become relevant later, the sort of private sphere of our lives um, that would be secret or um, personal or things like that, they are obviously our most intimate spaces. And when they're our own, we are intimately familiar with them. They're absolutely familiar to us. But for an outsider, they're absolutely unfamiliar. And this is the at the crux of the uncanny, um, which is this idea that the familiar and the unfamiliar, the canny and the uncanny overlap in ways that we find unexpected, and it gives us an uncomfortable feeling. This is also how the horror genre works, and particularly gothic. So then I started thinking about the gothic novel, and particularly Jane Eyre. And I really think that there's something to be said about the parallel roles that the spinster and the governess kind of play in the fabric of society in England from like, I don't know, the time when governesses were a thing up through like post-war Britain, right? And spinsters like governesses are women who were often from the sort of upper middle class, or at least Miss Marple is from the middle class, upper middle class. Jane Eyre, let's just use Jane Eyre and Miss Marple to compare. Jane Eyre would have been from the upper middle class. They are educated more than the average servant. They operate in this sort of liminal space between the upper middle class and the upper class. They have the ability to sort of transition between these spaces. They have the ability to be conversant with people who are in a lower social class than them, but also in a higher social class than them. They are perfectly acceptable in society, but they're not really fully integrated into the family unit. They're these sort of extraneous female persons that like aren't quite settled in a particular rank or social position or, or relationship to other people in their sphere. And Jane Eyre, like Miss Marple, is welcomed into the personal and private spaces of other people. Miss Marple has a great ability to be welcome and comfortable in her little intimate village. She's able to have insight into what's going on in this quiet village life. Likewise, Jane is particularly well positioned to see what's happening in Thornfield Hall, to see the movements and to see to see the behaviors of all of the different people, to observe the relationships that are happening, to participate 
participate in the social events like dinner or when guests are over, but also she can be, you know, conversant with the servants and sort of move around the back of the house and that sort of thing because she is an employee. And this, it positions her perfectly to be able to observe things that maybe nobody else would have access to or have the ability to see. She's able to see that something is not quite right in the house, that there's movements in the house, that there's signs of other people or forces that are in this house that are unexpected or, or unaccounted for. In the same way, Miss Marple is able to have such an intimate view of the goings and comings of village life that she's able to see that something is not exactly as it should be. And this is where the uncanny comes in, both for the gothic or for the mystery, is that the thing that you think is most prosaic, that should be peaceful, that should be safe, that should be home, is in fact a place of danger, is in fact a place of mystery, is in fact a place where threats happen. I think one of the really big differences between we see in this, the, you know, what we see in the role of the governess versus the spinster is their resolution. So for Miss Marple, she never is integrated into marriage, but she does have to take a full back seat after she solved the mystery to, you know, she never really gets credit for it. Presumably the other detectives that she works with and only a handful of detectives in England know that she's this master solver of mysteries. So she dissolves completely into the background. Her public role, she has no public role vis-a-vis -vis her ability to be a solver of mysteries. And so that is completely handed off to the male detectives who are in the stories. And it's never really explored, but presumably, you know, they bring prosecution, they bring the case, the person, blah, blah, blah. Maybe news stories break, whatever. But that happens all sort of off screen or off page. Once Miss Marple has answered the question, that's it. That's the, that's the resolution. Miss Marple doesn't have to have a um, sort of, she doesn't, the, the, articulation of herself as a solver of mysteries, unlike Sherlock Holmes, who becomes quite famous for it, she doesn't have that sort of public persona. It's all a private thing, which enables her to be very successful as her investigations because her investigations revolve around her being sort of like this background person, the person that you wouldn't expect, the person you feel comfortable sharing things that you wouldn't normally say to, the person who could be sitting in the corner overhearing a conversation, or the person who could very comfortably and begin having conversations with you that seem like gossip, but really she's trying to find out more information, right? And so her discreet persona is part of her success. For Jane Eyre, she does get married, obviously, to Mr. Rochester at the end, and it does seem that for the governess novel, for all of the Bronte sisters at least, because those are the primary governess novels that I've read, they do get integrated into the family system that way. Either, unless you have a story about the poor governess who, you know, has faced misfortune and has gone down in society over time because she was not able to secure a position because she's sort of in between classes, right? So she's not able to secure a position truly with the upper class where she can exit the labor or working class. So she's either going to slide down and maybe marry a servant or a driver or, or something like that, somebody who has to work for their career. So in the case of Jane Eyre, she gets married, she moves up into the higher social standing. And the interesting thing is that, of course, the governess, even though the governess and the spinster occupy, occupy similarly liminal spaces, they do not occupy the same role. And the role of the governess is really splitting across gender lines. She is both a teacher, which is a masculine role, and a caretaker, which is the feminine role. And we see that when Jane Eyre gets married to Mr. Rochester and she fully steps into the role of stepmother, obviously she maintains the role of caretaker, but she has to jettison the role of teacher. Adele is sent off to school. She can't really, it's not appropriate for her to be occupying that sort of dual gendered space anymore or that dual gendered role anymore. And that's how they get integrated fully into sort of the fabric of society, if you will. So, Anyway, those were some of my thoughts on Miss Marple so far. 
both the role as a cozy mystery, why is it cozy? And I think it does tie in with that fact, that reality of the Unheimlich, right? It's that we're in our most intimate spaces, but we're tidying them up, resolving them completely. And then um, that oracular truth that she has is just so comforting. We, I think we all wish we had somebody who could come into our lives and kind of just be like, oh, I see what's going on here and tell us to do this, 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 and this, and then we can move on and our lives would be fixed. What a fantasy. And then thirdly, I think there's just something really interesting to be said in this conversation around the similar roles that the governess and the spinster play sort of in British society as sort of, you know, extra women that they can't quite put into wife, daughter, whatever roles. Um, yeah, it's either like mother daughter role, like we have to kind of put you in one or the other. And so the anxiety around that and the desire to resolve that positionality within the broader social fabric. So those are my thoughts. That's uh, casual criticism with me. And I hope you enjoyed this little short video for today. And until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>